welcome Dr. Harvey Pass, who is the Stephen E. Banner Professor of Thoracic Oncology and Professor in the Departments of Cardiothoracic Surgery and Surgery at Perlmutter Cancer Center. And he's going to talk to us today about what's happening in lung cancer screening. So let's welcome Dr. Pass. So we're not going to talk about surgery today, which is kills me. But we'll talk about trying to avoid surgery. We're trying to avoid, in the future, surgery. And it starts with secondary prevention. Primary prevention is you stop smoking. Secondary prevention is you try and find something before it becomes a problem. And screening is what that does. Um, you would think that if you had a disease that killed most of people in the 1950s, then when they were diagnosed, that screening would be a really good idea. Screening has taken a long time to get here in lung cancer. Uh, and the problem uh, is that although it can change things radically, do paradigm shifts, uh, the problem is how do you implement it? How do you make it work? so that the patients can understand it, the doctors know exactly how to do it in a standardized way, and also that you interpret the CTs in the correct fashion that goes along with the biology of what Larry has shown you. And the biology of lung cancer varies from patient to patient. So this summarizes those two slides that Larry showed you, and the numbers are extraordinary. 300,000 lung cancers in men per year, uh, and just a little bit below that in, in women, uh, and that's in 2013. And that's why it would be nice to catch these early because most of them are caught when the patient is symptomatic. And when the patient is symptomatic, the long-term survival is not as good as when the patient doesn't have symptoms, presents with a nodule that Larry picks up on a CT scan. So this will be a short speech, but it will have certain highlights that I want to stress. And I want to talk about why we accept lung cancer screening now, but I also want to talk about what's the baggage that comes along with that and why it was so difficult and why you have to interpret it for the group that you want to screen and then finally, uh, how do you implement it and how do you get buy-in from a patient to be screened and not have the psychological sort of terror of having to come and get a CT every year or worry about what's going on? So this study, the National Lung Screening Trial, essentially took 30 to 40 years to come about. Screening was started in the 1970s, in which chest x-ray was used. But chest x-ray supposedly in a randomized trial at at least two centers did not decrease the survival of patients with lung cancer. However, the newer data that was brought about by our friends at Cornell, Claudia Henschke, talked about patients living 10 years, 90% if they were diagnosed early. That made the National Cancer Institute, your government, spend the money to screen 50,000 patients in a randomized trial. And that randomized trial was comparing chest x-ray to CT scan. And that trial actually screened patients for three years, starting with a prevalent scan. And what it found is seen right here, which is that 20% reduction in mortality if you had patients that were on the CT screening arm. So what does that reinforce to you that Larry said, CT screening is much better than chest X-ray screening because you will pick up things, it's more sensitive, but is it specific enough, which we'll get to, and then if you got screened for lung cancer, in all-cause mortality, in other words, dying from other things, just not lung cancer, 
patients lived longer if they had a CT scan? Because maybe something else was picked up that would have killed them. But what's the problem with CT screening? And Larry mentioned this, that you see a lot of nodules. And a nodule that is not a lung cancer is called what? A false positive. A false positive can turn into what's called a futile investigation or a futile thoracotomy. And that means you're operating on a patient for a presumed lung cancer and you operate on the patient and it's not a lung cancer. Now, the mantra of CT screening right now and the mantra of everything that's done in the thoracic oncology lab is to decrease the number of false positives. We don't want to take upwards of 15% of patients to the operating room only to find that they're operating on a benign problem. At the same time, CT screens pick up those ground glass opacities, which Larry talked about, they have a different biology. Not all lung cancers are deadly lung cancers. There are lung cancers that take eight years to actually evolve into something bad. Should you operate on those immediately or should you operate on those later? Where have we heard this before? We've heard it in prostate cancer. We've heard it in DCIS. It's the same idea. And that is the big picture problem with lung cancer screening at this point that goes to the translational. Translational, new research, answering questions to make things better, maybe even less invasive. And lung cancer screening opens all those possibilities to do that. So how many lives would you actually save if you applied lung cancer screening the way it was done in the NLST to a population like the United States? It's a good question. You've got 8.6 million Americans who would be eligible for this. It's a lot of money, too, to pay for all these CT scans. Well, you'd probably save about 12,000 lung cancer deaths per year, which is about 8% of all lung cancer deaths. Um, and the reason is that you don't pick up all the lung cancers. You follow them, and patients still present with late lung cancer, even when they present with lung cancer screening. Now, how do you improve and pick up the lung cancers in the group that you should pick up? What do I mean by that? So, could you take somebody that's 30 years old and screen them for lung cancer? Obviously not. You want to take the patients that have the highest risk of developing lung cancer. Larry mentioned that smoking is obviously one of those things that factors in. It's not the only thing. There are other things that factor in, including age, including things like family history, including things like whether you were exposed to fibers in your work, asbestos. How do you take those into account? Well. If you want to make lung cancer screening the most specific for lung cancer, you want to be able to screen the people that are the highest risk. At the same time, you can't be too stringent because you may miss some people. What about non-smokers? What do we even do about non-smokers in lung cancer screening? There are no markers for us to say that patient who is a non-smoker will develop lung cancer. So there's a lot of unanswered questions there. But the bottom line is that the benefit of lung cancer screening is seen best in patients who are at higher risk for the development of lung cancer. That real cohort, those patients that are highest risk, those are the ones where you're going to really get the bang for the buck of lung cancer screening. And if you do that, then your false positive rate if you use the best population, that false positive rate will decrease as you screen the highest risk patients because those are the ones where those nodules, you have to hire, have a higher reason that it's a lung cancer, plus the workup will lead you more toward lung cancer. So how does your government decide how much a life is worth? and whether they're going to pay for it. 
Well, it all has to do with the quality of life. It all has to do with how many years you live after you get a certain intervention. And that's that thing called quality, Q-A-L-Y. And there are certain ways in which the government says, if you reach a certain threshold of quality, in other words, life years saved by doing a certain intervention, and it's a number per life years, then they'll think about making that test approved for use or even having Medicare pay for it. So if you don't screen anybody, obviously the government's not going to pay anything. If you use a chest x-ray, it's going to be pretty cheap, but the problem is, is that chest x-rays are pretty lousy for lung cancer screening. So the cost of a low-dose CT scan, you know, on the market is 1600 bucks. So how do you take all those costs, look at how it's going to prevent lung cancer or save patient's life and put it together? The benchmark is usually breast cancer. It's usually $30,000 per quality. It's estimated that lung cancer screening is going to be about $50,000 which actually is pretty good. So when that was calculated, people started saying, maybe we should consider that the government should be starting to pay for this. And how did that come about? Well, the US Preventive Task Service, they're the kings of this. They're the ones that decide whether lung cancer screening is gonna be cost effective, whether the government is gonna consider it in the future to have Medicare pay for it. And it depends upon their recommendation. And their recommendation was that it's not the best thing in the world. Why isn't it not the best thing in the world? Just told you. It has false positives, and you may miss lung cancers, so it's not perfect. But it certainly shows a decrease in mortality from lung cancer. So their recommendation was a B. And considering that five years earlier, the recommendation was a C or lower, this study made a big deal to make lung cancer screening possible. So there was a lot of talk before it actually got approved about do we have the right population? Should there be older patients that should be put into this? Because the study was 55 to 75, and the smoking history was a certain thing, and it was smokers. So there was a lot of back and forth about this. And what actually happened was that they extended the age to 77, which is actually a good thing. Were there believers all over the place? There was not. The American Academy of Family Physicians still does not believe in lung cancer screening. They think that it causes psychological harm. They believe that it really doesn't match up to what is important as far as saving lives with this methodology. Uh, and they, don't think, they didn't think it should be approved. And they made a big stink about this. And this is where, in the community, it becomes difficult to get complete buy-in to have patients screened for lung cancer because the American Academy of Family Physicians is a pretty powerful lobby for your local PCP. And if your local PCP goes by their guidelines and is not going to recommend screening, then what, what are you going to do? Uh, I think that what you have to do is maybe get a second opinion about what is really going on with lung cancer screening. But there was a compromise. And the compromise was that as long as you had a shared decision making with the family and with the patient, that you explained everything and you documented that, and then you could put in a prescription for lung cancer screening. And this was the big day in February when Medicare actually said you could now go ahead and start lung cancer screening programs. Medicare would pay a certain amount for it. Uh, it, there were certain criteria for how it had to be done. And notice that it had to have counseling and shared decision making. And that's to warn the patients that there could be upsides and downsides that may lead to tests that may be harmful if you follow what you think is a lung cancer. So how do you actually start this? 
it's very, very difficult to get the nuts and bolts of a screening program started and to have everybody buy in, because you can imagine it has to do with changing the electric me electronic medical record, getting the radiologists on board, finding time for a CT screening program, find the personnel to be able to get all those patients screened, getting the radiologists to be able to take the time to interpret those CT scans. How do you interpret the CT scans? We have to have a standard way of interpreting the CT scans so that every patient is read the same way and you can interpret it. Oh, what happens after that? Adios, amigo? No way. The person who's actually taking care of the patient has to see the report of the CT screen and then call the patient and let them know that this is what we found and this is what is needed and uh, we need to see you in three months or six months and has to follow up with the patient. And then the process starts all over again, either at three months or at a year, depending upon. So that's a lot of personnel and a lot of buy-in from an organization to do lung cancer screening. But if you balance the benefits, which is on one side, and the key thing is decreasing the rate of lung cancer death, as opposed to the, upside, the other side, which is the downside, which includes the false positive scans, which includes radiation dose that Larry talked about. Uh, personally, as a surgeon, I, I believe that lung cancer screening is the only way to go at this point, and we need to use translational methods to make it even better. So you've got to be able at your own institution to figure out who you're going to offer lung cancer screening to, how often you're going to do it, how is the CT performed, and Larry didn't go into actually how many cuts and how, how much mega, mega voltage and all this sort of stuff that's necessary so that you have a standardized way of doing the CT scans. All of this that I mentioned, structured reporting and data collection, because your Medicare in starting these programs is starting a registry. So every patient, every program that started in lung cancer screening must send reports to Medicare, a central place, and to American College of Radiology to make sure that the quality control is what it needs to be. So it has to have shared decisions. It has to have low-dose CTs. It has to have a tobacco cessation program. So obviously, when we have patients come in for screening, they're asked, have you, are you smoking? When did you quit? Are you still smoking? And if they're still smoking, then they have to be referred for tobacco cessation. Uh, and also, these cases need to be discussed among the surgeons and the radiologists as to, is this something that is actionable or not? Should we just follow this, or do we do something now? What does it mean? So I personally think that getting the word out is very important. I think that lung cancer screening is accepted. I think that who you go to for lung cancer screening, I don't think is going to make much of a difference. And I say that because we are dictated to as to how you have to do the low-dose CT scans. But Obviously, you want to go to a place where you're sure you're going to get the type of follow-up and the personal care that a place like NYU does for patients with lung cancer. We follow the same rules that were mandated by Medicare, which you see here. Patients who have a 30-plus pack year exposure, patients who quit uh, within the last 15 years, once they come in and they call, we can see them, we can then put in the order and they get <laughs> CT screened. So. I think that the National Lung Screening Trial was a surprise to the National Cancer Institute, and it's a good thing that that surprise was positive and is going to help patients. However, as I've mentioned, implementing this, interpreting this, making it standardized is extremely difficult. But for people like me who are crazy and like to write grants and like to pay salaries for people in the lab, there's a tremendous opportunity to make this better, talking about using people's breath to try to see if they've got lung cancer, looking in their blood to see if you can then say that patient needs a CT scan, all those things which are unanswered questions which are going on now. So finally, yes, we do have a lung cancer screening program, and yes, this is the information for it, and yes, there's a website. So I think that you should keep this in mind and in your neighborhood and families and people who you know, if they're smoking, obviously they should stop smoking, but also you should maybe mention to them 
that NYU has the facility to be able to look at this and try to save their lives if they develop a lung cancer. Thanks very much.